Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're at we're at nineteen what now? Nineteen eighteen? Nineteen twenty? No, no, no. You're right now we're, you're in nineteen oh eight. Okay, you're at nineteen oh eight by now. Nineteen oh eight. You're at four you're at four, you're at forty years after the fucking civil war. Yeah. And these human beings are still dealing with this idiotic fascist idea that they can't even get into a ring and fight somebody and achieve the top that they can be based simply on race. That, that, should, that, should, make every, that should make every human being on the planet go completely ballistic. And I don't know why it doesn't. I don't understand that. I don't know why white America sat back and dealt with that. I don't get it. Um, you mentioned you mentioned earlier in a in a, in a different um, conversation that we had had um, something that I found fascinating, which was that Nazi Germany didn't tolerate this. Can you go back to that and tell me a little bit about that? Because I've never heard it put that way. I've never heard it put so eloquently as that. Can you tell me that again? Well. And basically, it's, it's the idea, it's the concept that once the Allies beat the Germans in World War II, Germany passed laws against the Nazis, right? You, you can't, you know, have a little Nazi shrine, you can't show the swastika, you can't re revere these guys. You can't look back at that as a nostalgic period. There are laws against it. So, every German, by consequence, has this feeling of like, no, we can't do that, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. There was never that imprinting of the loss after the Civil War to the South. There was more of a, a, a situation of really what they, what they were worried about. This is what makes it kind of like uh, it makes sense because we know how racism is still there now and we know how pervasive it is and it makes sense. At the end of the day, there were people who said, look, you know, uh, link their stories about Abraham Lincoln and his wife taking tours of the South and seeing the impoverished black people living on plantations and things and being truly struck that these were human beings and things like that. And Lincoln is, you know, an all-time special person uh, in history, right? But most not certainly. everybody was like that, right? So most, most, most certainly. Of the, a god, most a of goddamn the, national hero if ever there was one. But and most of the time, though, really what the Civil War was fought about, one of the things that Lincoln had to toil over was compensation. If I own 400 slaves and you're going to free them, who's going to pay me? Where's, what am I going to get? What's my money? And this is a lot of what they kept fighting about when it extended the Civil War, you know, with the money. Out. So now once they got that figured out and it got really ugly is why it's, it's a you know the brother fighting brother kind of thing Lincoln experienced that in his own family his sister's family was from the south right so it, it got, it, Lincoln did the best job he could I don't think he did everything he purely wanted to because he had to give a little bit so what they didn't do is pass these laws that say no 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 we not only we got to help these people because we've been crushing them for a couple of hundred years so now let's educate them and put schools up and let's say, nobody thought about what do we do with them after. All they said is like they're free and we're not gonna pay. So the North saved some money, the South was pissed, and it was like, all right, well they're free, well, fuck them, you know, basically. So they, they had no real uh, uh, help or assistance or acceptance, uh, you know. That what was done was wrong, so this is the consequence to try to make it right. It was just like, hey, you're free, motherfuckers, go. You know, and that's the ugly part. That's the part of it that where at the end of the day, if there's some privilege with some people, you know, and there, there were slaves who probably lived very well with good masters or whatever, that maybe didn't even want the system to end. And that's how warped that time was, you know. As well as most of the, of the you know, Louis C.K. is a comedian and he says, it very uh, crassly, he says, you know, the the white people were appalled because they took their slaves. It's like, I don't have slaves anymore, you know? But there was, I think, in high society, that precise feeling of people feeling that some of their privilege was taken away, right? So now this is an ugly, ugly time for everybody, I think. And I mean, not the black people are the victims, obviously, but the white people are resisting change and not changing, uh, you know, in, as a group, and not forced to change by laws, like I mentioned, that 
that well, is hidden and, germ. And, and and let and let's be let's be fair about this. Ignorance plays an enormous part in this, and it's and it's forced ignorance. It's an ignorance where slaves didn't have an opportunity to understand what they were going through. They had been institutionalized. They had been racially racially institutionalized for 400 years. They didn't know what they they didn't know what freedom was. They didn't know any of that. So you get a guy like Jack Johnson that comes along. He's from Texas, so he's born in a free-ish state, even though they were Southern, they were free. And he's born with a bunch of other impoverished people. Um, LBJ, it, it took until LBJ to even get electricity into the urban community or, it, or into the, the rural communities of Texas. I mean, that's how long it took for Texas to have a decent standing in the United States of America. It's no wonder they're so... It's... It is... Um, it's not difficult to understand that Texas sometimes is looked upon as backwards. They're good people. Um, I know a lot of Texans who are really wonderful people, but it is not difficult to understand why they are looked upon as backwards. They're not racist. They're looked upon as backwards because they just don't get it. And there's a lot of people in the United States that just don't get it. Okay, off my high horse. I got a little angry there. Sorry about that. It, it pisses me off. Um, no, it, it, but, but please, but please uh, don't let me interrupt. Go on. I, I want to hear more about Jack Johnson. I'm, I'm sorry. I it's it's, diff no, no, it's no, difficult no. to hear. It's difficult to hear. Sorry, my grand sorry. my grandparents went through Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. My grandmother was a survivor of the Holocaust. My great grandmother and my great grandfather did not survive the Holocaust. Yeah, no. I, look, any one of those subjects is a, is, a, is a real touchy subject. Racism in America, I I don't think has been properly examined and looked at. And this is what one of the things I've discovered through boxing is that, um, you know, go back a hundred years and the racism that's prevalent in the newspapers, in, in every aspect of, of things, uh, of life, you know, you, you start to see the weight of it. And I, I think only until you recognize the true scope of it, are you going to, um, you know, are you going to really uh, be able to deal with it properly in some way? Um, uh, I, 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 you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're shocked that in 1908, uh, Johnson couldn't fight in the United States for the world championship because of racism. That's correct. The bottom line is that within in that same five-year span, I think it was in 1904, 1905, there was uh, an exhibit in the New York City Zoo that had thousands of people arrive at it to see a pygmy. Now, at the end of the day, a pygmy is a black human being that was exhibited with orangutans and things in the zoo in 1905. Yeah. So, you know, that's, yeah. that's racism. That's, yes. that's what Johnson had to deal with. So if you took your family to see the pygmy at the, at the, uh, uh, at the zoo, what was your real thoughts on this bombastic black champion who's in the newspapers with white women and, you know, living the good life, sipping wine and racing fast cars and stuff. So, how, so dare, how he, dare he? How dare he believe that he could um, be with white women and be in the same room with white men and have money and have rights? And and, and, Johnson, and, and, and beat and beat up a white man in a ring. How dare he? How dare he? Now now so at the end of the day, okay, he's chasing okay, the world I'll championship. Stop. I'll stop. I'm sorry. I get that's but, but let's go back we're to We're touching the source so subject. I'm sorry. But we're talking about pre nineteen ten, you know, we're talking about uh just literally a time where people were still hanging on to the past in my opinion. And in general there were Obviously, some people moving forward and, and, and things like that, but a, a great deal of the country was still stuck in the past with, and trying to maintain some of the things that weren't, you know, uh, clear, you know, like they were made with laws in Germany or anything like that. So, and anyway, you got Jack Johnson as a champion. How does Jack Johnson become champion? He has to fight in Australia for the world championship. And a uh, idea that 
it was still being marketed and it was still news in the United States. It was still an American uh, contending for the championship is that the fight was on July 4th, right? Oh, wait, let me just make sure that that's correct. Hold on. Well, that's a brilliant move on on everybody's part if they did that. I mean, that promotionally the, the, speaking. The other, the, hold on, I just want to make sure. Because I know we fought the Great White Hope in 1910 on July 4th. I just want to make sure that the world title fight was also on July 4th. No, no, I'm sorry. It was on December 26, 1908, so it was right around Christmas. Oh, okay. So, all right, no. let's, let's go back a little bit. So, so Johnson is pursuing the world championship, but he can't fight for the United States. He actually has to fight for the world championship in Australia. Now, Australia is a white country, you know, English-speaking, so they were able to go over there, and they had a scene. You know, Bob Fitzsimmons, at the end of the day, was a middleweight and heavyweight world champion the generation before, uh, Johnson, and he spent time in Australia, so there was an old scene down there with people that built stadiums and stuff, and uh, they were looking to do boxing at a big level, and they presented, uh, you know, Tommy Burns versus Jack Johnson for the world championship, and they had the whole um, kit and caboodle. This fight is on video, so I encourage people to go back out and, and take a look at this. Take a look at the level uh, the difference in the phys physicalities of the guys and, and Johnson's ability to... And Johnson really looks like he's having fun in this fight. You know we'll what try, I mean? And, we'll try. and, you know, so what happens? The film crew turns the camera off as the end is very near and Tommy Burns is about to go down because they didn't think... In Australia, the crew they didn't think... That they, they wanted, wanted to have a video of a black guy beating a white guy, 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 guy. Or, or to, you know, win the championship. So the, the fight, fight cuts off literally with like 10 seconds. seconds. If you remember, I don't know, it was, it was the, the UFC, UFC that Marco Ruas fought Paul Marlins. Well, yeah, yeah. Fight on pay-per-view, that fucking fight cut off. Yes, it because did. Because they were over the pay-per-view, and it was like, what the hell happened? The polar bear goes down from the leg kick, and the fight, the, the, the pay-per-view goes off. Yeah. This is very much the same thing in history now. In 1908, they shut the cameras off because they didn't want to document. They, they, they just they had a historic. They have a historic film there, and they deliberately ruined the ending because of racism. The fucking can stupidity be, of that is can there be monumental. Anything more illustrative of how counterproductive that type of thinking can be. You know, as a historical piece, we're sitting a hundred years later. There's no one alive from then. You know, there's no one alive who was in that stadium. I mean, I'm almost, it's 110 years ago. I'm almost certain, if, you know, there were adults. There's no one alive. Because believe me, I'd love to keep talking about this, but take me, take me through. Johnson wins the championship. He wins riches. He becomes famous. He comes back to the United States. He fights in the United States. What happens? All right. He does, uh, you know, he beats Burns. Now, he doesn't fight a lot. He does come back to the United States. He takes uh, he takes exhibitions and does uh, tours and things like that. Uh, there's a documented exhibition of him uh, popping up in Canada. Uh, he fought uh, Philadelphia Jack O'Brien in Philadelphia to a draw. Uh, in May of 1909, so about six months after he won the championship, he fought in Philadelphia. He took another fight in Pittsburgh, another fight in San Francisco. Then there was an uh, important fight in October of 1909 when he fought middleweight champion Stanley Ketchell. Ketchell, another one of those guys that you know we could dedicate a podcast to, right? right, right. Um, dead at 26, shot by the husband of the man, uh, husband of the woman, who was making him breakfast. That's the story. <laughs> so Stanley Ketchell, a character in his own right. But they fought, um, and the story there was that they sort of made a gentleman's agreement, and Ketchell was a bad boy, right? They sort of made a gentleman's agreement they would carry the fight and, 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 and something along those lines. And at some point in the fight, Ketchell dropped Johnson. And he, he had a shot, he took his shot, and he dropped Johnson. And Johnson got up, and put Ketchell out to the point where they had to remove Ketchell's teeth from his gloves. Um, wow. There's video of that fight, too. You know, so we've got a great lore of Jack Johnson. Now, to me, 
The whole story of Jack Johnson goes to July 4th, 1910, which is his famous rematch with James Jeffries. This is also the fight of the century, actually. This is the one that was called labeled the this fight of the century. This is your July 4th fight. This is the big July 4th fight that, um, you know, was the great white hope. Jeffries, a former champion coming back from the farm and retired. It was 300 pounds farming in California. They put him through a sweat. You know, get them down to 220 and go and challenge and, and, and bring the championship home for the white people. And that's that was everything that the marketing was. And the bottom line is is that Johnson won the fight, uh, going away. Didn't really wasn't really challenged. The other guy had been retired long enough. Maybe he would never have been able to fight a guy like Johnson. Who knows what happened? But what happened on that day was that Johnson won. Twenty people died in riots across the United States. Of both. Uh, Flavors, right? White people looking for black people, and they got to get revenge. And then, you know, black people who may have been partying a little bit and happy and, and rejoicing, and also, you know, people not liking their party and, and not liking the happiness and stuff. So, like I said, there were riots documented across the country, and uh, you know, like I said, twenty people died on that July Fourth in protests and, and and riots that occurred after the fight because the black man beat the white man. After that. He doesn't really fight again for a long time. He gets one fight in against uh, Fireman Jim Flynn in, and then the next time you see him fighting is in Paris because it's in between 1910 and 1912 that he gets charged under the, the Mann Act for transporting white women. Now, he was living a can good go, life. Can you go into that for me? Yeah, yeah let, let, let's get into this here. I got, we, we've seen the magazine before, and I've got this magazine is now... 107 or, or 108 years old. This is November, uh, first week of November of 1910. So we're coming right up on uh, on the holiday of this. The cover is Abe Tell, another another one of those characters from uh, from that time. Abe Tell, a Jewish featherweight champion. Also, Abe Tell is. If everybody remembers the 1919. Uh, Black Sox World Series that was a thrown World Series in baseball. Yeah, yeah. And, and how the Black Sox players, the uh, the, the White Sox guys, uh, eight of them agreed to take ten thousand dollars in cash each from a, a big a gambler to throw the World Series. Abe Mattel is the fighter uh, who worked for uh, the man providing the money and delivered the money to the uh, to the uh, Black Sox. So Abe Mattel, former featherweight champion, little crooked nose, I bet. Uh, also was doing some dirty work there. He actually never spent jail time uh, for that uh, time. He fled to Canada. So another one of those characters, Abe Mattel. But Abe Mattel is on the cover, but in the centerfold, which usually gives you a wrap-up of what's going on, and I'll, I'll close in on this for us here, we've got our friend Jack Johnson. Nice. Car racing. Nice. Bring it up a little and, bit. Right there. Perfect. And the driver is Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson's driving there, Woo! and what he's doing is actually racing against the race car champion driver of Cigar the time. He got, smoked, he got smoked and beat, and apparently the guy's name is Oldfield, but Oldfield known, and you had you could just you could see the type of car that they raced, you know, the big old machines and stuff. You're talking about the very early history of car racing. So now this gives you an idea of Jack Johnson being bombastic a little bit, right? You have you have guys that, you know, toil and work and stuff, but he had gotten the spoils of world championships, you know, this is a $30,000 purse kind of thing. thing. Now he's, he's got, got some money, money, so he's, he's having, having some fun. fun. Cars, fast cars, cars. He, died he died in a car accident in 1948, so, so that, that never left, left him, right? right? And, and then, then the man act, which is what he gets in trouble for, and uh, what it was, was uh, transporting women across the state border with immoral purposes in mind. So this what, is what, what does that mean? What does that actually mean? Look, it's an old law from the time, and I'm no legal is it Jim or, or anything of sort. Uh, I, I, I see it as uh, a law against trafficking and prostitution. I don't even know. If it was, I think it was it was made worse for him because he was a black man bringing white women across the border. Some of them were his wives, you know. So Jim yeah. Crow either way. Yeah, I mean, it's against it, but I think if a white person had been bringing women, like, you know, had a car full of women going to Connecticut for a strip, you know, type of show and stuff, that he might have been susceptible to the same laws. I don't know that for sure. But he was charged with 
Precisely that, transporting a woman from one state to another, crossing the border. And that's what he was charged with in 1912. So he had to leave the country. And he did leave the country for eight years, didn't return until 1920. He fought, um, you know, uh, for the championship in Europe. He fought, uh, actually, he lost the championship in 1915 while he was in exile. He lost it in a fight in Cuba against Jess Willard, who basically was a big farm boy. Um, you know, 6'6", 240 at the time, was an absolute giant. And, um, and, and what, was, you know, what guy, was Johnson by then, 220 maybe? Yeah, probably 220, 6'2", you know, and used to be big. You can see in the Burns fight the physical advantages of him. You can see he's actually, you know, Johnson's a very interesting fighter. The videos from that time don't do us a lot of favors if you're trying to analyze him as, as a true boxer compared to people now because the video is just of a totally different quality. But you can see a very sophisticated defensive boxer there, a guy who... Uh, would even accept, yeah, hey, you're not hurting me and stuff, and, and, and kind of carry the fight. Like with Burns, he's clearly having fun, if, if you ask me, you know? Um, but the videos are, are there of the fights. In 1915, he lost the world. By then, he'd been in exile for a few years, probably living a good life, you know? And Willard came in very motivated, very strong, and, uh, you know, they yeah. fought for 20 something pounds. Now, Willard is the guy who Jack Dempsey almost killed him, you know? A round and a half to take the belt, and then from there the Dempsey era was born. But it's connected to Jack Johnson through Jess Willard. So Johnson didn't return to the United States until 1920. Now in 1920, he comes back and serves a year for the crime of bringing women, you know, across the state border. So he actually went back to the states. Now older, five years removed from his world championship, looking to come back, couldn't stay in exile any longer, and actually went and served the time for these crimes. This. Do you, know where he, do you know where he served his time? He served in, are you ready for this? Leavenworth State Penitentiary in Kansas. Leavenworth now I think is a military jail. Jesus um, Christ. Leavenworth, okay. Leavenworth is, is one of the worst you could be, but I mean that was bad. That's, 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 that's the thing is, is, what could Leavenworth have been like? If we know, if you hear the name Leavenworth now, it's like hearing Alcatraz or or, yeah. you know, Rikers Island in New York, or, or it, it's one of those things where it's like, Bad. people are like, oh, that's rough, you know? But was Leavenworth that rough in 1920? Probably. <laughs> Probably <laughs> way, way, way worse than we think it was. I don't think he went into a country club, right? But maybe he did. I don't know exactly what the details were, but just the fact that his liberty, deprived of liberty, the former heavyweight world champion, deprived of liberty for almost a year, Eight years after whatever happened, and it was a crime of, you know, being in a car with a woman and going from Connecticut to Massachusetts or from North Carolina to South Carolina, as it were, or whatever, in those southern states. It, it's just, it, it's a, a crime that boggles the mind. And that's why it really does, you know, I, again, politics aside, this is a no-brainer to me that uh, Barack Obama would have received this and said, this guy's not pardoned. Let's pardon this guy. You know, the race aside, George Bush should have done it just to do the right thing. You know, Bill Clinton should have done it. Somebody, somebody, Richard Reagan. Nixon should have done it. N Nixon. Roosevelt should have. You know, when he died in the forties, Eisenhower should have done it. But that's my, you know, we're boxing people in this. But this guy, we've been talking about him in his history and stuff. Again, he lived a life. He lived his good life. I mean, there's great pictures of him. And here he is. This is just news coverage from 1910. Racing cars against the guy. Cars were an exotic luxury. This is almost, this puts him, to me, almost on the level of one of, not Elon Musk, because he was more of a, of a bon vivant jack. Well, Elon Musk is a, a little bit of a business genius, too, yeah, aside. But that's, that's when, when you're talking about guys that are on the edge of stuff, Elon Musk building rockets because that's what he likes and stuff. Jack Johnson buying cars. When not everybody had a car, people were still riding, you know, horse-driven wagons in 1908, 1910. You know, the, the car was that new technology. The car was that, hey, that drone that flies you or that drone heli uh, taxi helicopter thing that takes you there when that's pilotless and the pilot's sitting in a building somewhere. The mo modern cutting edge, that's what Jack Johnson wanted to do with the car race. Car racing and early boxing and wall gas love car racing. Um, 
I'm going to forget the big Milwaukee sponsor's name, but one of the owners of the Milwaukee Boxing Clubs that put up a lot of big fights, including, you know, uh, world championship fights with Stanley Ketchell and uh, uh, Billy Papke, four of the bloodiest fights of all time. Um, he was into car racing, and he, he, he actually made his fortune by uh, buying a, a fleet of like 30 or 40 cars and starting a car rental that eventually became Hertz or one of the big car rentals and stuff. So you're talking about that uh, uh, where boxing meets with people that are, you know, on the cutting edge of film at that time. Hey, what can we film? Well, we can film that guy juggling and we can film, or we can film boxing. Wow, that's great because we can see how the motion of the cameras and stuff. So you had their congregation of technologies. The car was brand new, right? Uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and the interest in boxing was right there. The camera, the fact that we have these fights on camera now, by, by the time these fights were filmed with Johnson, the Fitzsimmons Corbett fights had been filmed 10 years before. So filming of fights, it's, but it still wasn't easy because getting the equipment together, making sure that the film could be stored. There were a lot of fights that were filmed uh, that the film didn't survive. So it was like, well, we didn't get it. It's like, what do you mean you didn't get it? Could you imagine, you know? But th this is the kind of thing that happened. It was thousands of dollars to set up the booth that protected the cameras. And, you know, these weren't like, hey, guys with, like, the, you know, the little video cameras that are on their phones like they do nowadays, you know what I mean? This was a heavy deal to get done. But it's the start of what technology is. And boxing's always been there at the front. And Jack Johnson was one of the first champions that documented that for the, for the world, you know? Because his access, and the way the media had access to him, again, you're talking about um, telegraphs and people being able to get, get, you know, they got results from Australia relatively fast across the country, you know, with telegraphs and things like that. So the world was really becoming smaller. Boxing was at the edge. And Johnson really was, to me, the first, uh, you know, definitely the first black sporting celebrity. Um, and probably after... Uh, uh, John L. Sullivan, the next boxing guy that crossed over to be, uh, you know, like a celebrity, like a Madonna, you know, the, like that. Like uh, you know, Joe Choisky was a boxer through and through. If you like boxing, you know Joe Choisky. Jack Johnson was a guy that people knew who he was, even if they never saw a boxing fight in their life. So Miguel, we're um, uh, for some reason we're getting a poor connection. Um, Hey, listen, let's wrap this one up. Give me the finals on Jack Johnson and tell me why we should care right now today about what Jack Johnson is and about what he was and about what he means at this moment. Three minutes. Well, I, I mean, I think I said it at the beginning of the podcast and I truly believe that. I think you're talking about Jack Johnson. Uh, you can talk about him as a boxer. You can talk about him as a boxing hero. You can talk about him as a black hero. And I would like to put forth the idea that he's just an American hero, black or white, whatever the guy survived, sure. that white people should honor this guy as, as a hero as well. If that's if they're not doing that, then you know, then I don't know if we're addressing racism correctly. But to me, he's a hero because of everything that he fought for and everything that he put up with, and he still carried on, you know, and, and he was his own self. There's a lot of the trash talking and things that Muhammad Ali will tell you that he, uh, you know, uh, became the epitome, you know, you know, was the first person that that did that in the media, that did that, you know, deliberately tried to antagonize people, you know. With, with, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was trying to do was sell and things. And he was he's a, he's a character that I think um, because of racism isn't, didn't because you know it would have been nice to see Jack Johnson fighting in the states, you know, from 1910 to 1915, defending that belt instead of getting only two or three fights in. Just as a pure sports fan, right? Um, so you you know you get. I think you're talking about an all-time great boxer. I think you're talking about um, a guy who won and kept the world championship uh, under. A pressure that we, and that's what we've touched upon in this podcast, under a pressure that I don't think we can fathom, you know. I mean, I think it's an insult to Jack Johnson and Floyd Mayweather talks about how bad he's had it because of racism. 
Now, I'm not saying that Floyd has had some type of effect. I agree. You know, Agreed. And, and things like that. But to me, it's an insult for him to compare himself. You know, just like when Barry Bonds said, you know, they made me a bad contract offer. Now I know how a woman feels when she's raped because he was being so abused by that. These are not parallel comparisons anymore. Floyd did live, live wow. a, a different thing. So the pressure that Jack Johnson fought under, I, I think I think he's an American hero. I think if white people uh, don't honor this guy, and I think Trump actually may have been, you know, in his own, maybe for his own reasons and stuff, but I think he took a, a progressive step in pardoning him. And I think that that's uh, good for everybody. It's good for everybody because there's no way that in the annals of history that this guy uh, needs to be uh, have a criminal. Right. It's just it's just a, a taint that is gone now. And I think it's the proper thing. It's it's laws that shouldn't be laws. Hey, I'm going to close this with this one little one little thing that I can that I can say here, and um, I'll let the audience judge this any way they want to. What if Donald Trump decided, I'm going to pardon this guy because I love boxing so much and because I have supported boxing for so many years and that this is bullshit and that it should have been done a long, long time ago and I don't know why in the hell Obama didn't do it. I voted for Obama. I voted for Hillary. I voted. I'm a far left liberal. I can't get any farther left than you can get. I wouldn't vote for Trump if you paid me. But nonetheless, I got to give the man credit. He pardoned somebody that deserved to be pardoned. No one else did it. Hey, um, signing off for the Cage Rage Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe below if you want to keep hearing us because we need you to subscribe so that we can keep doing this because if we don't get money, we don't keep doing this because this takes obviously a lot of time and a lot of effort. And a lot of this. So please subscribe below. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. Chadillac at the Cage Rage Podcast.com. McGill at the Cage Rage Podcast.com. You can catch us on Facebook. La dee da. You know all that shit. Get with us. McGill, been really great talking to you. I'll see you again here in a little bit. Thanks so much, man. And uh, to people out there in podcast land, thanks for your interest in Jack Johnson. Thanks for reaching out to us. I hope. Uh, like I said, I, I, I don't think uh, any of the historians on Jack Jones out there are going to be surprised when anything we said on the podcast. But uh, I do know that we got it right, and I do know that he deserves more scrutiny. And uh, I, I just hope we whetted somebody's appetite. Go out and look up the man, uh, a true American hero. Thank you, Miguel.